You're listening to Law, Guns and Freedom with Gianluca Zanna on Guerrilla Media Network. Hi everybody, this is Luca Zanna. You're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom on KTOX 1340 AM and on Guerrilla Media Network. This is our two. We talk about guns. Guns, training, uh, also philosophy. I mean, I'm not talking about guns must be a philosophy, but for sure it's a way to think. And also it's a cultural factor, that's for sure, at least in America. Uh, I have with me, again, I'm very proud of it, uh, the General Operational Manager of Frontsight Firearms Institute from uh, Paramp, Nevada. It's one of the, pa- the places that I really enjoy the most since I became an American. I have the opportunity to train with uh, incredible people and also with incredible curriculum that normally law-abiding citizens, called also civilians, they were never allowed to have access to such type of training, especially around the world. If you come from Europe especially, there is no way you can do that. So, And uh, this was for me one of the most intense and beautiful things I discovered as I became an American, to be able to be part of the Frontside family. His name is Brad Hackman. Brad, are you there? I am here. Thank you, Luca, for having me on. You're welcome. Probably my accent on your last name, I, I kind of distorted. There is no H, right? Ackman, right? No H. It's Ackman, like Ackerman with no E-R. Perfect. Okay, I want to just to be sure. Mm-hmm. I'll try to improve my accent and my grammar lately as much as I can. I have a personal <laughs> tutor on top. Okay, listen, Brad. First of all, thank you very much again. I know you're a busy guy. You've been, uh, last time we talked to you, you were also in Alaska. There is another front site facility in Alaska, correct? There is. We have a small facility just outside of Kenai, Alaska, which is south of Anchorage. And we, we have it strictly for seasonal purposes for July and August, mm-hmm. when it's quite hot in the Mojave Desert, as you well know. Uh, the temperatures in Alaska are gorgeous. So we switch our training efforts uh, to Alaska, as well as we do a bunch of indoor stuff here in Nevada. But it is pretty hot outdoors in, in Nevada, so we, uh, we like to uh, go to Alaska during the summer. Okay, perfect. And you have pretty much the same type of curriculum, or you have some maybe some specialty uh, classes that normally we cannot attend in Nevada? No, it's the same curriculum, but it's smaller offerings. In fact, the only courses we offer in Alaska are the skill builder level courses. Mm-hmm. So it's not the introductory level, but it's really the next step up. And uh, there, it's a small facility, small ranges, so it's personalized. And it's, of course, gorgeous weather. It's really very much a resort, like, retreat-type setting. It's, it's a lot of fun. Very good. I'm very excited. Maybe one day I will fly to Alaska. I never really had the chance to We'd love to, to have you. We'd, very we'd love to have you, yeah. Thank you. Now, let's talk a little bit about, first of all, today is, uh, you know, Sunday, and uh, you have a busy uh, class. I heard that, like, more than 400 students are there right now, correct? Correct, yeah. On Friday, we started a course that had about 430 students, something like that. So that's pretty big for us, particularly uh, this time of year. It's still pretty warm, although today the weather's nice. I assume you're enjoying the same weather I am. Yes. And, uh, it's, it, but it's still relatively warm, so we, we tend to see lower enrollment in September. And then, of course, it bumps up in October, November when the weather gets better. But for, uh, for right now, 450 students or so is, is a pretty big course for us. When the weather's nice, we'll easily see over 1,000 students a week. Wow. And uh, also, this is another thing I would like to remind the, the listeners. Frontside is uh, the school, the only institute in America that has more students than all other schools combined. And uh, it is not just about quality, excuse me, quantity of volumes, but also quality. One thing I'm really impressed, you know, I've been life member about probably about almost five years now. And I did different, you know, transition from uh, the beginning. I was Diamond, then I became, um, uh, what it is, uh, Ambassador and then Guardian. But the point is, I still find, and it's pretty amazing, I want to be very critical. And also I want to remind to the listeners, this is not a sponsor show. This is my real opinion and my true feelings about Frontsight. You know, you, you, the, the school, the, the system, the curriculum, regardless the huge increase in numbers of students is still top. And that's kind of hard to believe because normally when big organizations become also bigger, it's hard to find, to keep the, the quality. Instead, I still see, I've been doing several classes and I still see the same type of attitude, the same type of professionalism and more important, uh, strictly close to the curriculum like Dr. Piazza, you created. I know that. So com- congratulations right. for that. Now let's talk a little Good, bit more technical things. First of all, you know, one thing I wanted to talk to you, uh, something that uh, I know Frontsight offers 
UZ or full automatic classes, mm, not just yeah. UZ, OZ, but also M16. I think that's great. Right. It's a great opportunity. Now, specifically, the focus would be, first of all, we had an accident here that I don't know if it's just, a, I want to leave it like accident. Uh, part of me, I would like to say is also negligence, but let's keep it like an accident in uh, Arizona, exactly not that far from where I live, uh, that uh, a nine years old uh, little child was given uh, access to this uh, Uzi full automatic and the instructor, unfortunately, he got killed. Um, yeah. I know that FrontSight has uh, programs for even teenagers to have access to uh, full automatic weapons like the Uzi. What is the difference? What would be, first of all, the thing that you see that could be done better in that specific situation? And what exactly the frontside policy to try to avoid uh, situations like that? Sure. Well, let me just give you a little bit of framework in terms of the courses that we offer at FrontSight. We have a children's course, which is for children aged 5 through 10. Then we have a youth course, which is ages 11 to 15. And by age 16, we encourage those students to join our regular courses because our philosophy is if they can drive a car, they should be shooting a gun. However, we accept students as young as 11 into our regular firearms courses if they're accompanied by their parent and the parent has taken that course before. We team them up in shooter coach format so the parent and the child are always together. And at that point, we're welcoming them down to the age of 11. Okay, so back to the original question that you had about um, what do we do to ensure safety and what is our philosophy in terms of putting full automatic weapons in the hands of children. We start the firearms training process with the youngest people on site. In other words, we don't shy away from guns in the least for the young kids. And as I say, that's down to age five. We start with a, an indoctrination. That sounds a little harsh, but <laughs> a, a familiarization with the four safety rules, the four universal firearm safety rules. We make sure that they fully understand them and can actually apply them. And with those firmly in hand, nobody's going to get hurt. Those four universal firearm safety rules guarantee everybody's safety. The interesting, and dare I say unique, aspect of the four safety rules is that you have to violate two of them before anybody gets hurt. Now, just as a quick refresher, uh, universal firearm safety rule number one is treat every weapon as if it were loaded. Number two, never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. Number three, keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And number four is be sure of your target and what's in line with your target. Now, you have to break two of those rules before anybody gets hurt, let alone killed. So we start with the four safety rules, and then we go into familiarization of the weapons themselves. And we start with age-appropriate weapons, lots of 22 rim fire, just so they can get a chance to handle the weapon, become familiar with it, and, of course, to enjoy it. We don't want to make this a big, scary experience for a young child. We want them to have a good time. As they gain some familiarity with the easy weapons, of course, we'll move up. We'll move into handguns and eventually into full automatic weapons. We shoot Uzis quite a bit, as was this uh, situation in Arizona. Uzis are easy. They're fun. They have a relatively slow cyclic rate. They're heavy. They're forgiving. They don't recoil that much. They're just a great, a great weapon, and they're, they're fun to shoot. So we have uh, our children shoot Uzis fairly routinely. If they're safe and if they're up to it, in other words, their skill level is up to it, and if they want to. So we're not forcing them to shoot anything that they don't want to shoot. But to be perfectly candid, most kids want to shoot an Uzi. I mean, how fun is that? They get to go home and talk about having shot a, a full automatic Uzi, and that's a lot of fun for our kids. Okay, so you got to do it in a way that guarantees everybody's safety. Now, I have, I have never met the people involved in that Arizona incident. I am certainly not trying to pass judgment. Uh, the only thing I have seen are the videos, uh, particularly on YouTube, and I've only seen little snippets. I have not even seen the full video. It all, most of them stop, all of the ones I've seen stop at the point where the child fires the weapon. So I'm not sure I even have a full perspective of what happened in that particular case. But let me give you my opinion on what went wrong. Okay. First off, there was a lot of discussion about should there be, should, should a nine-year-old child be receiving training on a full automatic Uzi? Well, make no mistake, 
what they were doing was not training. Mm -hmm. There was no training involved at all. It was strictly recreation. Yes. And that's okay. There is nothing wrong with recreating with firearms. That is a totally valid activity, but let's not kid ourselves. What those two were doing was not training. Additionally, we have, we make no assumptions that the child is in charge of that gun. In other words, we, the instructional staff, are in charge of the gun the entire time. Mm -hmm. For example, we generally handle the student from the firing side. For a right-handed student, that means from the right-hand side. In the video, I saw the firearms instructor on the left side of this right-handed girl. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that's the wrong side. There's, if you're going to work with gun handling issues, you want to be on the firing side. If you're looking for marksmanship issues, you're typically on the support side. But the safest location to be, the one where you have the most control, is on the firing side. So first and foremost, he was on the wrong side of the child. Secondly, we kneel down with the child and hold the Uzi with the bottom of the magazine. Of course, the magazine comes right out of the pistol grip on the Uzi, so you have a handle right there. So we, we hold the bottom of the weapon and then typically the back of the child. So we have one hand on the shoulder, the other hand on the gun, and that gun is in complete control by the instructor. Now, the child is pressing the trigger, and the child has the sense that they are in control. Well, they're in control of the trigger, and they're having a good time. But understand, the child could simply let go of the gun. They could, they could fall over into a, an epileptic seizure, and mm -hmm. nobody's going to get hurt because that gun is in complete control of the instructor. So the fact that there was an injury, let alone a fatality, means that something was clearly not being conducted correctly. I agree. And, you know, it doesn't make sense what you're saying because my opinion is very simple. First of all, a child, you know what I, what I think about guns. I mean, I, honestly, I don't even think that uh, I'm so radical, if you want to use that term, that I don't even believe that we should supposed to have a permit for a full auto. But at the same time, my logic says if there is not a real, uh, first of all, physical uh, body that can somehow... Uh, be able to control a, a full auto weapon. I mean, nine years old, you know, come on, it's it's not somebody that, unless it's somebody special, I mean, every age is different, but at the same time, average nine years old girl, I don't think she has that type of control. So the only way it would make sense to me is exactly as you express, because uh, to have an instructor that knows what he's doing and he controls the weapon no matter what, that could be a very great, uh, beautiful experience to, to, to cherish and to, for, to, to remember. But the way Correct. that I saw the video it was completely, in my opinion, you know, and I'm sorry because I know the people and also the, the, the owner of the company there, and I think that was a mistake. There was something that was, should have been done better because there is no way I would ever give complete control of any weapon to somebody, to a kid that never had a, pre tra pre a previous training, period, first. Right. This is the number one problem. As you said, there, was train there wasn't there was training there. There was just some sort of recreational. Nothing wrong yeah. when somebody is already prepared for the type of stage to have fun. But there was no any type of real education in guns handling. And to give a little child, like I give now to a fighter son, I give, okay, he's 14 or 16, let's say. Let me give you the key of a Ferrari. I mean, it's something that is not exactly the first car you would like to learn how to drive, you know. So. Right. And that's why I don't like to, uh, because unfortunately then where we create a situation for legislations and hysteria and of course all this anti-gun crowd to create new legislation. I believe that first of all, there is responsibility. The family should be the first people responsible. I would never let have my child access to a full auto weapon unless I know that there is a real training before that and more important, I can physically control it. And at the same time, I'm sorry. Right. The instructor, I think, as much as I feel sorry for him and his family, it, it was a problem there. But anyway, I'm glad that you sh at least you expressed, because I was really curious to know exactly how Front Sight handled this uh, experience with full auto uh, weapons with children. And I think it's very important that you let people know that the instructors at Front Sight, they are in control of the weapon. So it mostly is like almost more of a, an opportunity to push, the, squeeze the trigger and be part of this experience. But the instructor at the end is the final driver of the car. And that's exactly right. And of course, that's based on age and skill level. By the time these children have, have some skill and the physical stature to control the weapon, then they are in control. 
but they have the skills and ability to do it at that point. So the description that I gave a moment ago is, of course, for the new shooter who's very small, much like this nine-year-old girl in Arizona. Mm -hmm, exactly. Good. Right. Okay, let's move on to new things. First of all, I attended uh, just a few days ago a class that I really enjoyed. It's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes I always forget name. It's uh, Advanced Integrated Tactical Handgun Class. Sounds like a very fancy yes, long right. name. Good. And uh, the experience that I had was very interesting because uh, it was a class that I was able to start to think out of the box or even better, shooting out of the box. Normally, we had the range, the target is in front of us, and of course, you know, it doesn't shoot back, but at least, you know, the idea that you need to have some sort of, uh, reach some sort of, 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 of um, as you say, time frame and, uh, you know, speed and all this, this stuff, accuracy. This was even better because we started to shoot from uh, under the car, on top of the car, and running around on the move. I thought it was a very great experience. Normally, we cannot do these things at the regular range out there. Right. But the thing I would like right. to talk with you mostly is something that uh, I think was even more important than everything was uh, the house home invasion scenario. Okay. And, um, you know, we know very well that even as much as you can train, it's something very not to recommend, not even the pros would do it, especially when you're by yourself, to go to clear a home. It's something that you need at least two people and should be also very well trained. But in some very specific situation, like uh, the home invasion that we have to face at front sight, unfortunately, uh, in 911, it's only like 20 minutes away. So we try right. to at least start to ingrain in our body, in our brain, our, some situation how to handle. Can you just please give the basic concept of how to somebody should handle mistakes, things to avoid, and things to do correctly if somebody has to clear a house in a desperate situation to try to rescue a family member? What would be the first things sure. to avoid and the things that would be, at least even if we cannot show them physically, but we can put them in people's brain? Right, right. Okay, great. Um, I think many people have a very romantic notion of clearing a house because we see it on Hollywood, we see it on TV routinely. And we see the good guy clearing the house, shooting the bad guys. He comes out safely in the end. He's the hero with the pretty lady on his arm. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you that that is such crap. That is not the way it goes on the street. Here's the very first thing that we tell our students when it comes to clearing a house. Don't do it unless you absolutely have no choice. It is by far the most dangerous thing you will ever do with that gun, bar none. It turns into a crapshoot, 50-50 mm. at best, when you're chasing some bad guy through your home. You must first have a very compelling reason to be chasing a bad guy through your home. And there's only a couple of things I can think of that would warrant that. First, I don't know, maybe the house is on fire and you got to get out. But secondly, and more realistically, if you're going to the defense of somebody else, for example, it's a hostage situation, he's taken a loved one hostage, he's at the other end of the house, and you've got to go solve that problem. Okay, so you're gonna, the first thing you're going to do is pick up the phone and dial 911, okay, because you want the cops there as soon as you possibly can. Hopefully they can get there quickly, and frankly, turn it over to them. Let them do it. They're going to clear a home more often than you and me. They're probably pretty good at it. Let them do it. But in the scenario that we have created at Front Sight, they maybe are 15 or 20 minutes away. Well, that's obviously not a workable solution because the bad guy will have killed your loved one in that amount of time. So under that situation, you're headed down the hall to save your loved one. So in this case, we're talking about tactical movement. There are several principles which come into play when you're clearing your home. One, of course, is stay away from the bad guy. Maximize your distance because a front sight trained student is a good shooter and distance favors the trained shooter. So if you can be at 15 feet instead of 15 inches, you should because the front sight trained student is likely going to get a good hit at that distance whereas the bad guy can get lucky up close. So stay away from the bad guy. Additionally, use cover and concealment as much as you possibly can. Cover stops rounds, like a, an engine block of your vehicle, the gun safe, those sort of things, hard structures. Those will stop rounds. Concealment is something that simply hides you, so it's a visual barrier. Could be It could be a shower curtain. It could be a piece of plywood. It could be anything that you cannot see through. 
right? It's not as good as cover, obviously, but it still has some value because the bad guy cannot see through it. So use cover, use concealment as much as you possibly can. Additionally, as an individual, not team tactics now, but as an individual, you're going to take your time. Go slowly, go quietly, be as stealthy as you possibly can because that allows you to control the pace of the engagement. In other words, it allows you to act, forcing the bad guy to react. And as an individual, that's what you need. You don't have all of the assets of a team. For example, intel, distractions, diversions, limited areas of responsibility, overwhelming force, superior weapons. You don't have all that as an individual. So what you do have is the element of surprise. So you've got to go slowly, you've got to go quietly, and don't give away your position. In other words, don't be dragging your feet. Don't be you know, dragging your equipment on the wall as you search through the house. You've got to keep a silent uh, approach as you, work towards that, as you work towards that room. Um, additionally, the gunfight, or rather the tactics, are going to boil down to a gunfight. Okay, it's not clearing the home isn't about the tactics. It's about putting yourself in a position to win the gunfight. And a lot of people don't understand that. A lot of people think that if you've got some very cool whiz bang tactics, that that is somehow going to win the fight. That is not true. Tactics in and of themselves don't win anything. It's still going to boil down to delivering a controlled pair to the bad guy before he delivers one to you. So this is still going to boil down to gun handling and marksmanship to win the gunfight and thus save your loved one. So we do a lot of different exercises from the new students up through the very advanced students with respect to clearing a home. And obviously the, the, the situations get more and more complex as the student's skill warrants. But the fundamental thing, the, the, the take-home message to all of this is don't do it unless you absolutely have to. Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, I also like to rem remind the listeners that uh, Brad also is a book author, and uh, there is a book that I really, I still re like to read at night before between some tactical books. <laughs> I like to laugh a little bit, and I really enjoy it because I can open any page of that book and start to have a little bit of five minutes relaxing time, and also I can visualize it because I've been there, and I can see you somehow at, at night writing this stuff, all these experiences. Please remind the name of your book and what it's about. Yes, and I appreciate you mentioning it, Luca. Thank you. It's called In the Trenches at Front Sight. So the title kind of connotes behind the scenes, you know, a peek behind the curtain of what goes on at Front Sight. And, of course, we've been in business for, I don't know, 18 years, something like that, and I've been in the industry for almost 30 years. So I've seen all these crazy, funny, hilarious things which go on behind the scenes, and and there's so many that I finally started writing them down, and of course that evolved into a book. So this is not a training manual. It's not some heavy gun philosophy or anything like that. This is just the lighthearted, crazy stuff that has happened to, to me and to the front site staff over the years. I mean, all sorts, of, all sorts of things and trials and tribulations as we were building the facility. Uh, some of the years that I spent under Jeff Cooper, who's now deceased, he of course lived in Arizona as well. Um, we have, as I mentioned, that Alaska facility that's produced lots of funny stories, not only firearms, but also fishing stories. Brad, website, um, website where people can get it, please. Oh, the website, yes. And it, if you simply go to bradackman.com, that's B-R-A-D-A-C-K-M-A-N, obviously that's my name, bradackman.com, takes them right to the website for the book. 